so what is multiphase flow i mean uh, people who have some background in fluid mechanics uh, you know what a single phase flow is right i mean it it is made up of just one type of fluid uh, a multiphase flow is made up of more than one type of fluid. Uh, i am getting some uh, audio here i mean could you uh, mute your yeah. audio yes uh, manjunath i'll take care of them okay yeah thanks ajay so uh, a multi i think uh, now it's fine okay thanks ajay so i'll continue okay yeah so a multi phase flow is a phase flow uh, which has two or more immiscible phases uh, flowing simultaneously in a given domain what i mean by this is uh, in my system or domain of interest i have two or more fluids which don't mix with each other um, an example of that would be the gas liquid flow i have a picture of that at the bottom of the slide here so i have gas bubbles being entrained um, into a liquid here so that would be an example of a multi phase flow usually a multi phase flow is made up of one continuous fluid in this example the continuous fluid would be water and a dispersed phase which in this case would be uh, my air that is being entrained so my gas bubbles will be my dispersed phase and my water would be my continuous phase uh, we see multi phase flows all across us every single day uh, for example if you uh, i mean now is the monsoon season in india so rain would be an example of a multi phase flow as well i mean we have liquid droplets that continuously travel uh, in a medium made up of air right so my air is the continuous uh, phase there and i have liquid droplets which is a discrete discrete phase that um, that is being transported continuously in my system of interest um, another example um, that we commonly see uh, in the natural world is what of uh, volcanoes uh, so a volcano would be an example of gas solid flows so in the case in the case of volcano uh, my atmosphere which is essentially made up of air would be the continuous phase and uh, the eruption uh, that happens which releases a whole bunch of gases and other particulate matter uh, they would be the discrete phase so it's again an example of a complex multi phase flow uh, that we see in the nature uh, coming to the flows of interest i mean we are essentially interested in studying flows um, that we see in the industry right so an example of that would be uh, uh, an hydrocyclone um, so i have a schematic of an hydrocyclone shown here on the right so you can see that uh, the feed here i mean I, i've marked the feed stream so it goes through the pipe uh, and the objective is to separate the liquid and the solid so as the pressurized feed passes through the hydrocyclone separator um the denser phase which in this case are solids they're pushed to the walls and the lighter phase uh, it goes to the center um and because of this uh, vortex that is formed in the center we uh, take out the liquid from the top and our solids come out of the bottom so this would be an example of a multi phase flow system that we uh, come across in an in an industrial setting um uh, moving on to the next slide uh you guys must have seen a lot of you know chemical factories and you know other industries so what do real engineering systems look like you know they look like something like i've shown on the slide i mean i've I have some examples of stir tank reactors so this is where you you have a big tank with an impeller that is used to mix a multi phase system uh we also see a lot of fluid as bed reactors in this i have a bed of solid particles and um i blow air or some kind of gas from the bottom to fluidize my uh, particles or suspend my sub particles um we have industrial boilers we have distillation columns so all of these are examples of real engineering systems and what you would notice in all of these is um they are made up of metals you can't really see what is going on inside so it's very difficult to visually see 
the kind of process that takes place inside this um, process equipment. So this is, I mean, this is one of the characteristics of uh, any complex engineering system, right? I mean, it's difficult to visualize what's going on because you don't, you can't see what is going on inside. It's difficult to, you know, come up with experimental techniques that revolve around visualization to um, measure and understand the process in detail. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the fact that it's difficult to visualize these uh, complex processes um, because of the nature of the uh, design that we that we come across. Um, so moving to some of the applications of multi-phase flows, I mean, uh, even though you might not have paid attention, um, these flows and systems, they're all around us. Um, starting with something that is uh, more prevalent, even without, uh, you know, uh, human involvement. I mean, we have uh, natural and earth sciences, for example, um, the flow of a river, um, sediment transport, um, weather modeling. I mean, these are all examples of uh, large scale multi-phase flow systems. Um, we commonly see multi-phase flow systems in uh, chemical applications, I mean, any chemical plant will have a bunch of equipment and processes that uh, essentially deals with uh, more than one phase. Um, some of the examples are uh, bubble column reactors, stirred tanks, um, separators, fluorized bed reactors. And these equipments, they're used to produce a lot of different raw materials, um, such as polymers, um, engineered particles, pigments, etc. Um, a lot of applications in uh, mechanical industry, such as boilers, aircraft engines, internal combustion engines, um, where we essentially inject liquid fuel. Uh, it breaks into smaller droplets uh, in, a, in a medium that is made up of uh, air. Essentially, we have oxidizer and fuel. Um, Power generation, coal combustion, I mean, you pulverize the coal, you uh, combust the coal, so you have uh, coal and your oxidizer as your uh, two phases there as well. Um, you see a lot of applications in uh, mining field as well. Um, you crush and grind the ore, um, so you have more than one phase there. You have centrifugal separators, you have frost flotation, you have high temperature processes. Um, similar in nuclear industry, um, cooling equipment, heat exchanges, and so on. Um, some not so common examples would be uh, food industry. I mean, we consume a whole lot of processed foods uh, nowadays. So some of the drinks that we would drink would have like more than one phase. It would it would be an example of a liquid liquid uh, multi phase flow system where uh, you'd have this first phase being suspended in a continuous phase. Also a lot of raw materials, they're processed in, in a bunch of um, chemical equipments. Um, so again, it would be an example of a multi-phase flow system as well. Um, similarly, um, pharmaceutical and biotech fields, um, you coat your tablets and you uh, produce your uh, tablets in these specialized equipment. Uh, that would be again an example of a multi-phase flow system, um, your enzyme productions where you you have your uh, microorganisms and stuff. I mean, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd want to transfer mass across your different phases. So you would uh, inject uh, bubbles of different phases um, in stir tanks. So that would be an example of a biotech application. Uh, and some of the other examples would be, you know, your shampoos, toothpastes, deodorants, lotions, cosmetic, etc. Um, they usually have more than one phase. So they would all be examples of uh, multi-phase flow systems as well. Uh, I'm just listing some that came to my mind, but there are uh, hundreds of other applications and systems that involve multi-phase flows. Uh, but the question is, you know, why use CFD, right? I mean, uh, we have all these processes that are in place today, but um, why would you want to use CFD to study these uh, processes? And uh, the answer to this question is not simple. I mean, you have, uh, it's a fairly loaded question, uh, but a simple 
answer would be that you know the experimental measurements um, that are in place to study some of these systems and flows uh, they're very expensive and you can't really do these experiments in um, real plant scale systems so you mainly do the experiments in small scale lab scale systems uh, and you try to use that information to uh, scale up uh, and you know uh, kind of transform that solution uh, across a much larger scale uh, so there are a lot of assumptions and simplifications involved and we saw that you know a lot of times uh, especially for fluid mechanics uh, a, a lot of techniques involve uh, visualization i mean they, they it involves taking pictures of the system and then analyzing those images uh, using image processing techniques to extract useful information uh, because our systems are uh, opaque one because the geometries are like that uh, two because we have more than one phase um, so it, it makes using some of the well-established uh, visual techniques uh, useless uh, for multi-phase flow systems. And also you need to understand that, you know, uh, a lot of experimental measurements, um, they give us point information. Um, but, but when we are looking to um, understand an entire system, point information is not very useful. So, uh, the kind of information that we get from experimental measurements is uh -huh. quite limited. Um, and, um, and also the other thing is, you know, we usually don't measure the quantity of interest directly. For example, if I want to uh, measure the velocity of my flow in a multi-phase flow system, I don't directly measure the velocity, but I measure uh, some electrical signal that is again transformed into velocity using certain transformation functions. So there are some errors that are introduced uh, when we do experimental measurements. Um, and a lot of times uh, when we deal with complex systems, um, it's not possible to put a probe inside the system uh, because we might be dealing with high temperatures or pressures uh, that might damage the uh, experimental probe. Um, so it may not be possible to do actual experiments. So these are some of the reasons why uh, doing experiments or you know uh, getting reliable data through experiments is going to be difficult. Um, when when we use the computational fluid dynamics, which is a numerical way of getting a solution to a complex problem, is done correctly, um, we get the correct. That we're interested in because it is a numerical way of solving uh, the problem at hand uh, the complexity of the geometry uh, and the process they can be easily handled if we have the right models in place right i mean we if if i if i want to solve a problem that involves high temperature if i know the models you know the model uh, to solve for the transport equation of my energy correctly, then I can easily solve that. I mean, it it's as simple as solving any other problem if I have the right model. Um, also, CFD allows engineers to test out a lot of different designs on computer. Um, and, if, and if you really want to do an experiment, you don't really have to do experiment on all the possible design scenarios. So CFD can help you narrow down, narrow down the design and then only do experiments for um, the cases that, that are most relevant to your application. Um, these are some of the applications of uh, CFD for studying multi-phase flows. There are many more, um, but right, I mean, any, uh, any usage of any tool comes with a but. So in this, uh, it is very easy to you know, generate very colorful plots and images using CFD. Um, but we need to be careful. We need to understand uh, what the model that you're using is capable of, and you need to clearly validate your findings. I mean, when you use um, any numerical technique to solve a problem, you need to make sure that the predictions that you're getting from the model are accurate. And you need to do that either by comparing your results against um, experimental data 
that you might have for the same system or try to look at the literature. I mean, if you can find something in the literature that resembles your system, you need to compare it against that. Or if, you, if you're solving a plant level problem, then you need to use some of the information from the plant uh, to make sure that you know, you're in the right direction. So it's very easy to get misled uh, by the colorful images and plots that CFD can generate uh, and get carried away. But uh, you need to make sure that it is a tool and you need to learn how to use this tool efficiently to answer engineering questions. So that is more important. Um, going forward, I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, we, we come across multi-phase flows every single day, even though we may or may not pay attention to a lot of these. Um, they can be broadly classified into, uh, you know, some of, uh, some of these flows. I mean, I've listed six of them here. Um, when I say gas liquid flows, what it means is um, I have a continuous liquid phase uh, where I have gas bubbles being transported within this continuous liquid phase. Similarly, I have gas solid flows. I mean, I have solid particles uh, in a continuous gas phase. Uh, my liquid gas flows would be an example of rain. I mean, I have gas or air as my continuous phase and I have uh, liquid droplets falling down in this uh, continuous phase medium. Um, another example would be that of the internal combustion engine where um, I inject my liquid fuel and this fuel initially comes in as a jet. It breaks into smaller droplets uh, and finally it, it evaporates and you know we have combustion in the um, IC engine. So this would be an example of liquid gas flow. Uh, we would have solid liquid flow where my continuous phase would be liquid and my dispersed phase would be solid. An example of this uh, would be a tank where you're trying to suspend solid particles or you, you want to like, you know, dissolve your solid particles in a liquid phase and you're, you know, stirring this mixture in a, stir tank. That would be an example of a solid liquid flow. An example of liquid liquid flow, uh, we usually see this in a lot of extraction processes. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this process called solvent extraction, where you mix your organic and aqueous phase phases, where both of uh, the phases are in liquid uh, form. So you oh. You bring them together, you, you mix them. Uh, so you form fine droplets of one phase in the other phase. So that would be an example of liquid-liquid phase. Similarly, some, some systems have all the three phases. You would have gas, solid, and liquid phase in, in, a, in a system. An example of this would be uh, froth flotation in mineral processing, where you would have solid particles on gas bubbles suspended in a medium of uh, water. So that would be an example of a gas solid liquid flow. So this is uh, a, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think we'll uh, just wait for some time and uh, get question from the uh, participants here because we already have a question from um, Akshay Mugaria. Okay, okay. So um, we can wait and attend those questions. Okay. So guys, uh, if you have any questions, you, uh, if you want to ask uh, the presenter, you can uh, unmute yourself if you want to, if you are in a uh, silent background or else just uh, type your question in the chat box to get it answered. Okay, so type your questions in the chat box, guys. Meanwhile, Manjunath, uh, I think there's a question for you here. Uh, like okay. Akshay Mugaria has asked, consider laser welding in, uh, in a closed chamber with an inert gas flow. In case if you specify a surface from which the discrete phase is injected, can you know the height to which the injected particles can go along a inert gas flow? Okay, let me read the question one more time. Okay. Yes, we could. If you know, um, 
you could you could definitely solve a lot of these uh, complex problems uh, if you know your boundary conditions very well. So okay. the accuracy of your solution would depend on how well you prescribe your boundary conditions to be. And a lot of times uh, that becomes a real challenge because uh, your conditions sometimes are not constant. So you need, you need to figure out a way to, you know, for example, if something is changing in time, you need to figure out a way to prescribe the boundary condition uh, in a transient way. So uh, there are a lot of models that can account for uh, different physics, uh, but how do you couple um, the physics along with the boundary conditions will determine how accurate your uh, prediction is going to be. Uh, yes, uh, fuel sloshing would be an example of multi-phase flow. If you want to consider your flow, uh, your fuel and uh, your air interface. So that would be an example of multi-phase flow as well. Uh, we won't be looking at how, uh, at any fluent, uh, in particular, I mean, I'll, I'll show an example um, where uh, I've used fluent in the past to solve uh, a problem, uh, a multi-phase flow problem. So, but we won't be looking at any uh, uh, fluent example as such. Uh, you would, I mean, that's what you would learn in the course. I mean, uh, if you take this course, you'll learn how to classify your problem into one of those uh, different flows and pick the right uh, approach to solve your problem. Uh, okay. Um, meanwhile, um, guys, uh, can you all stop annotating in the slides because that will disturb the meeting? And uh, Manjunath, you can as well clear the annotations made and uh, proceed further. Okay, let me see. Uh, hey, Manjunath, this is actually Sarang here. Hey, Sarang. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so there is an option called disable participant annotation I'm yeah i uh, did that just now i don't know how to clear the ones that are okay so do you see the annotation so there is a bar that's floating right which says mute yep chat and all that stuff right it's a floating bar and there's an option called uh, annotate <clears throat> do you see the annotate window where you can find the pen tool I don't. Uh, okay. Do you see the microphone icon, which which will allow you to mute yourself? Yeah. Now uh, in that there okay. should be an option yeah. called annotate. So yeah. let's click okay. on that, and then you will have a, another sub toolbar. Okay. So uh, yeah. There's, a, yeah, there's an option called delete. Actually, you can use the option delete, and you can just delete all annotations instead of going one by one. This is clear. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see, let me, I got a few more questions here. Uh, so Abhinash, it would be, uh, it, would, it, it would depend. I mean, in this case, uh, you would have entrainment of your gas in liquid uh, in a sloshing problem. So, in that case, your uh, uh, across the interface, uh, your continuous phase would be uh, liquid, and your gas bubbles will be discrete phase. Similarly, uh, some of the liquid might get separated from the continuous phase and form uh, liquid droplets. Uh, in that case, your gas would be your primary or continuous phase, and your um, liquid droplets would be your discrete phase. But there is a different approach to solve uh, problems where you have a clear separation of uh, phase uh, phases. It's called uh, volume of fluid method. I'll discuss that in detail in the coming slides. Um, uh, yes, in that case, for the rocket fuel example, yes, it would be an example of uh, solid liquid gas flow. 
Uh, so someone is asking me if if I can. Okay, Sampath, uh, a liquid liquid flow is just like your gas solid or gas liquid flow, but your discrete phase in your liquid liquid flow would again be a liquid instead of being a solid particle or a gas bubble. So it's a liquid which doesn't mix with the continuous liquid phase. So there is a clear boundary. There is a droplet suspended in a liquid. So that would be an example of your liquid liquid flow. Okay, so Manjunath Sarang here again. Yes, sir. Uh, you can just take one more question. Okay. And then uh, you can continue. Uh, guys, uh, what I would suggest is, as and when you get a question, type it in the chat box and uh, you know let's try to keep the questions meaningful. And then uh, Rajesh, uh, when you're going to take the next question break, you know, you can basically select a few questions for Manjunath to answer and uh, you, you know, so that way we can uh, finish the presentation in a timely manner. Yeah. yeah um, okay. Yeah. So I'll, I mean, I, I'll, I can get back to you guys on the classification of, you know, all these examples uh, into different problem uh, or the flow type. Uh, Yes, I mean, uh, to answer your question, Kevin, um, so Kevin is asking uh, in CFD is temperature and pressure considered? Uh, if so, how? Uh, if it's an isothermal process, then you don't really need to consider the temperature. But for example, say if, if there is some kind of heating, then you consider the temperature by uh, accounting for uh, another set of equation for your phases called uh, energy equation. So you basically solve your uh, uh, enthalpy or internal energy equation depending on uh, what you want. So that will give you the temperature um, of your system. Yes, and pressure is considered in the uh, transport equations for your uh, momentum transport equations for your uh, phases. Um, so that is one of your primitive variables. So you, uh, you need to have a solution of your pressure. Uh, when you solve uh, flow equations. Uh, okay, Rajesh, so I think I'll uh, get back to my presentation. Uh, so we can save the questions for the end. Yes, Manjana, you can proceed okay. with the presentation. Ah, okay. Okay, so um, starting, uh, you know, back from this classification, yes, so uh, there were a lot of questions on, you know, uh, how would we classify uh, some of the flows of interest, right? So uh, you need to you need to think about it, right? I mean, uh, in some in some cases you have uh, taking the example of gas solid gas liquid flows. Uh, in some cases you have liquid, and then you have gas phase that is distributed in the liquid phase evenly that would be very different than a case where your gas and liquid are separated across uh, a well-defined interface, right? So the approach to solve problems of this kind, they're going to be different. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, in some detail in the, in the later slides. But uh, so we, we discussed the fluid mechanics aspect of these uh, different problems, right? But then, um, these problems, they're also coupled with other mechanisms. And some of those are heat transfer, right? I mean, we had some questions on, you know, how to account for temperature of the system. Um, usually these systems, they, uh, they're they also coupled with heat transfer. Either, um, either the systems generate heat, in which case you need to cool the equipment by taking the heat out through a cooling jacket or something. So there is usually some form of heat transfer. Uh, there is also phase change. You could have uh, your liquid phase evaporating. Uh, so you, and a boiling would be an example of this. I mean, uh, initially you would have all liquid, but then you would form these gas bubbles uh, because of phase change within the system. Uh, so this is a fairly complex problem to handle. Uh, but you would see that uh, in a multi-phase flow system. Uh, there could be mass transfer. Um, so you would see this in, in the case of uh, gas liquid flows where uh, the mass could be, you know, 
uh, transferring across the surface from your gas bubble to your liquid phase. Um, similarly, for liquid-liquid uh, flow problems, uh, there could be some sort of mass transfer uh, from one phase to the other phase um, across the interface. Um, usually, there are chemical reactions going on uh, in a lot of these flows. Uh, so your species are uh, being formed or uh, destroyed uh, as the process takes place. Um, and when we have these discrete particles, for example, gas bubbles or liquid droplets, these can uh, collide with each other. Uh, they can form a bigger droplet or a bigger bubble. Um, if there is turbulence in the system, then uh, the turbulence can act on the liquid particles, break one into two or more smaller particles. So you could account for all these mechanisms uh, individually or a combination of some of these uh, if they're dominant in the system um, in your CFD approach. So uh, today we have fairly well established uh, guidelines to account for a number of these mechanisms uh, within multi-phase flow framework uh, to solve fairly complex problems. Um, but like I said, I mean, this is a very broad field uh, to gain a level of experience in, in problems of this magnitude takes time. So, uh, but if you're committed to it, then it's possible. It, it requires a lot of uh, systematic study and, you know, uh, making sure that you, you use the right approach. Um, so going, moving on, uh, let's go to the next slide. So in this, I discuss some of the flow regimes or different types of flows that we would see in a gas liquid uh, flow, right? I mean, going from left to right, uh, we see five different flow regimes. Um, and we would see this depending on uh, the volume fraction of your dispersed phase um, and depending on the velocity at which your dispersed phase is moving, right? I mean, uh, on the leftmost, uh, uh, okay, let me see if I can annotate this. Okay, so uh, the leftmost uh, picture here, I mean, it shows your uh, gas bubble traveling up in the axial direction uh, in, a, in a liquid phase. Uh, and these gas bubbles, they are well separated. They don't seem to be interacting with each other. Uh, but as you move to the right, so the volume fraction of your gas bubbles has gone up. You see a lot more bubbles. They are in contact with each other. They might be colliding against each other. Uh, there could be some other phenomena like uh, bubble coalescence that could be going on in the system. Moving on to the center one, I mean, you see, instead of individual gas bubbles, now we have some individual gas bubbles, but then we have a big slug that is being transported up, right? I mean, the physics that that are going to be important in each of these cases is very different. And you need to know which regime you're operating in to make sure that you use, you choose the right CFD approach, right? So in the first one, you don't really need to consider the interaction between bubbles. In the second case, the interaction between the bubbles might become important. In the third case, what is more important is to correctly predict your size of slug, because that is what governs the transport of your dispersed phase within the system. Right, so different, you need to have some idea of, you know, what is important and what might be going on in the system to be able to choose the right approach. Uh, so going on, let's look at some of the flow regimes that we might see in a fluidized bed for uh, gas solid flow, right? I mean, uh, so what we see here is we have, uh, we have a, bed of solid particles um, and we inject gas from the bottom um, at uh, just a second manjanath sorry for that uh, rajesh are you there yes sir can you mute all participants except manjanath i think some yes i did
Okay, uh, so I'll continue. Okay, so one second, Manjuran. No. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So, Sharan. Uh, yes. So I have muted everyone, but once they click join or you subsequently during the presentation, they happen to unmute themselves. That doesn't happen. There's a checkbox called as unmute everyone, right? Okay. It there's an option called don't allow participants to unmute themselves. Correct. There's a checkbox. Okay. You see that. Uh, so where is that exactly, sir? Okay. I have so, uh, clicked on the mute of participants on entry in the more options. Um, can you make me the host? I'll take care of it. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, Manjurath, you can carry on. Okay, sure. Thanks, Sarang. So, again, we see a lot of different, you know, flow regimes depending on my gas flow rate in the system, right? I mean, at low gas flow rates, all the solid particles are evenly suspended. But as I increase the flow of gas through the system, we start forming these bubbles that, um, that rise through the solid bed. Uh, as I inject more and more gas, it becomes, the bed becomes more turbulent. So uh, depending on what your gas injection flow rate is, and your properties of the solids, such as its diameter, its density, and so on, uh, you'll have an you'll have an estimation of what where the uh, what kind of flow you might get in the uh, in the system. And depending on that, you choose the right um, CFD approach to solve your problem. So this is again an example of what you might see in a real system and how you would use the information. Uh, to make sure that you choose the right CFD approach. Um, just to give, give you guys a bit of background on you know different approaches. Um, so I've listed some approaches here. There are more than these, uh, but these are some of the most commonly used ones. So the first is the mixture model. Uh, in this, we treat our continuous and dispersed phase to be one single mixture, and we solve the transport equation for this mixture. Uh, we account for the uh, interface forces between my uh, continuous and dispersed phase uh, appropriately uh, when using the mixture model. Um, there is another approach called as Eulerian Lagrangian model. In this, uh, for those of you aware of you know these terms, um, you'd learn all of these models in great detail if you take this course. Uh, but this is just to give an idea of you know what the different approaches are. So in Eulerian Lagrangian model, uh, you would solve your continuous phase in Eulerian framework, but your uh, discrete, discrete phase, for example, if, if I have a gas solid system, um, I would track individual solid particles by solving Newton's second law of motion. So uh, I would solve transport equation for each and every particle. Um, and depending on uh, what the volume fraction of my dis dispersed phase is, I can select the level of coupling between my um, continuous phase and my dispersed phase. So uh, there are, you know, one way, two way, four way coupling um, that uh, that will let us, you know, uh, handle uh, different volume fractions in the system. Um, similarly, when my volume fraction is more than 10, for the dispersed phase, uh, it's not uh, it's not computationally feasible to solve uh, transport equations for each and every particle in the system. So in that case, we will use something called as a Eulerian Eulerian multifluid model. In this, we make an assumption that uh, I can treat my dispersed phase as a liquid or a continuous phase uh, or a as a liquid phase as well. And then I would solve uh, the transport equations for both of these phases, in all in framework. Um, in two fluid or in multi-fluid model, uh, the most important uh, uh, part is to, you know, account for the uh, interface uh, interactions between my uh, phases. So you can account for that by selecting the right uh, drag model or lift model. So uh, depending on your uh, problem, uh, you might have more than one uh, dominant uh, 
interface uh, force. Usually drag is the most dominant um, interface force uh, between the phases, but uh, in some cases, exam uh, some for some forces like lift or turbulent dispersion uh, or surface tension force might become active uh, so you could account for all of those using uh, suitable submodels um, and for gas solid flows um, again i mean this this is a fairly complex problem and there is a framework called uh, kinetic theory of granular flows um, that accounts for uh, your collision in uh, solid particles and how the energy is, you know, uh, transported, this collision energy is transported within your uh, solid phase. So there is this framework of uh, kinetic theory of granular flows that is used to um, solve uh, gas solid flows where the solid phase volume fraction is very high. Uh, so we briefly discussed the uh, fuel sloshing problem. Um, for a problem like that, where there's a clear separation between your phases uh, we would solve uh, we would solve such problems using a, a model known as volume of fluid model uh, where we essentially solve single uh, set of transport equations uh, across the domain but then we would solve some additional equations uh, to resolve the interface between the two phases uh, so i would have a phase indicator function to uh, tell me where and how the phase uh, the shape of the uh, interface between my, say, fuel and gas or air would evolve over time. Um, so such a problem would be handled using a volume of fluid model. Uh, one thing to note is uh, these volume of fluid models are usually transient in nature um, because they, they change with time. So it's difficult to make a steady state assumption uh, when using VOF models. Um, so they they tend to be uh, you know transient and they they take some time to get a complete solution of the system. Um, and a lot of times, uh, multi-phase flows uh, they also happen to be uh, you know uh, turbulent in nature. So you need to account for uh, how the turbulence is uh, you know accounted for in the system. So there are uh, again a lot of turbulence models that are uh, uh, proposed in the literature, you need to use the right one that uh, that makes sense in your case and uh, gives you uh, fairly accurate predictions. So when you take this course, you'll learn, you know, uh, which particular model to use for your problem, uh, you know, what kind of interface forces to account for in your problem uh, and what to ignore uh, and what uh, turbulence model to choose uh, effectively because uh, you can again create your system as one single system for for turbulence model but you could solve um, the transport equations separately or you could solve uh, turbulence transport equations uh, for each and every phase uh, but then again it, it makes your system more complicated so you learn how to you know pick the right uh, choice of models uh, if you take this uh, multi-phase flow course. Moving on, uh, this is what a general workflow would look like. You know, first the first step is to establish the physics of the problem. You need to first list all the important phenomena that 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 are present in the problem. For example, fluid mechanics is a given. Um, on top of that, you need to see if there is significant heat transfer, um, and if if the heat transfer is significant it would again go as one of the important uh, physics that that governs the problem um, the third would be something like uh, chemical reactions if chemical reactions uh, are need are are important if if the reactions are exothermic if they are the source of heat generation in the problem then they need to be accounted for as well um, if you have uh, say gas bubbles and if you think that you know those gas bubbles are breaking up and are coalescing to form a bigger bubble, uh, then you need to account for that using suitable submodels. So before you go on to uh, you know, model your system using CFD, you need to properly understand the major physics that are uh, present in your problem. Once you do that, and once you make some simplifying assumptions, like you know what to 
what to keep what to ignore uh, you can you can uh, start to see what would be the right approach for your problem so this is when you think okay uh, i would go with a euler and lagrangian uh, approach to solve my problem because my volume fraction is low uh, and my solid particles they don't seem to be reacting uh, or interacting very much with each other so in that case if your number of solid particles is less if it's on the order of uh, 50000 to say a few million then you can use uh, something like a euler and lagrangian approach uh, once you do that the next stage is to you know uh, make your geometry and make the mesh for your uh, domain um, once you do that you need to make sure that your mesh is adequate you need to make sure that you know the mesh that you decide to use uh, gives you uh, consistent and accurate results and for that you need to uh, do this study called as uh, grid independent study where you would successively refine your mesh to make sure that your solution doesn't change appreciably um, this is a well established technique in cfd so if you've taken any cfd course you must have come across this but um this would be the next step in the process uh, once you have the grid in place uh, you would choose the right uh, modeling framework and you would uh, get your uh, predictions from the model if you think the model predictions are not satisfactory uh, you go back and you make sure that you refine your models or if if you think if you think that you know certain physics of the problems were not well accounted for uh, you would account for that through suitable sub models and then again you would uh, solve the problem again in your cfd solver which in this case would be ansys fluent and finally if you get satisfactory results uh, you would make sure that your results are satisfactory by comparing your predictions against some experimental data uh, from your uh, i don't know lab or from your uh, chemical plant or equipment or whatever if you don't have relevant experimental data you would go and look for a suitable system in the literature and that you could uh, replicate to make sure that your approach is well validated uh, once you have a well validated accurate uh, numerical solution you would post process the uh, results and you you would generate uh, beautiful plots and graphs um, and use that in your engineering calculations right so that is what you want i mean plots and graphs are one thing but then uh, cfd can tell you important things like you know uh, the mass transfer rates uh, for your entire equipment or you know the peak temperatures that you might see in the equipment which which is difficult to measure using experimental techniques so cfd will give you this these important insights into the process uh, moving on i will click, quickly show an example of uh, a stir tank that i did in the past so this is uh, what you see here is a schematic of a stir tank so this is a pilot scale system um, of uh, which which has a diameter of about uh, 630 mm and a height of 630 mm so this uses a impeller uh, so this type of impeller is called a rushton turbine so this is this has a flat disc uh, with six uh, vertical blades um, so once i make a cad model of this i i make a mesh of my geometry so the mesh is shown here on the right so because my system is symmetric i won't be considered under an 80 degree section of the uh, geometry because it saves time uh, and i can uh, i know that the system is symmetric so this makes sense to use only uh, half of the problem uh, or the numerical domain um, so this problem was solved using uh, euler and euler in two fluid uh, model uh, framework uh, we, we will see some results in the next slide so these are some of the results that i get once i uh, solve the problem so on the left here uh, we see the uh, volume fraction of air so i when i go back so i have this ring so this ring is used to inject air in the system and my system is completely filled with water so when the air comes up because my impeller is rotating at 390 rpm um, 
it distributes the air throughout the tank. And I see that, you know, my air is fairly well dispersed um, throughout the stirred tank. Um, and we also get information such as sort of mean diameter. So this is uh, one way of representing the mean bubble size in the system. And uh, I'm comparing the predictions from my CFD model against some experimental data from the literature. So you can see that the experimental data at point E, for example, says that the bubble size is 4.1 mm. And my CFD predictions um, give a value of 4.47 millimeter. And these are two other uh, predictions from um, other, uh, other researchers. And you can see that uh, my model that I used uh, to solve this problem gives a fairly well description of what is going on in the system. So this, give me, this gives me confidence that my model gives a fairly good representation of what is going on in the system. And I can use this model to say, for example, you know, see what happens if I increase my impeller rotation speed, how would my distribution of air change inside the system? Or where would I see, you know, smaller and bigger sized bubbles in the system? The bubble size distribution here is important because it will tell me what my mass transfer rate is going to be uh, from my gas phase to the liquid phase, because depending on my bubble phase, uh, I would I would estimate the total surface area available for mass transfer. So this gives me very important process description, uh, which again is fairly difficult to get using uh, experimental techniques. So this was an example of. Uh, uh, example of you know using CFD model uh, modeling approach to solve a complex engineering problem. Uh, moving on, I mean I'd like to you know just give a brief uh, sort of you know uh, I, I gave a brief uh, outline of what this course might be, and then now I want to see I mean I want to tell what this course would be you know useful for. So this would be useful for undergraduate students in mechanical, chemical, automotive, civil, biotech, I mean, all of these uh, branches of engineering, you uh, come across uh, multi-phase flows uh, very commonly. So taking this course would give an introduction to multi-phase flows and uh, it will also equip, equip you with tools to solve uh, some of the flows that you might encounter in your uh, college courses or in your uh, professional career. Similarly, for graduate students who are just starting out uh, with their uh, Master of Engineering or Master of Technology course, uh, this would be a good uh, introductory course. For entry-level engineers, I mean, um, a lot of times people are not exposed to some of these advanced modeling techniques. So taking a course like this would make you more uh, skilled uh, and more valuable to your employer. Uh, so if you're looking to gain additional skill set, then this is this course is very relevant to you. Um, similarly, for experienced engineers, uh, if you if you already have a few years of experience, but not directly in fluid mechanics and CFD, um, this course will introduce you to um, multi-phase flows and you know how to account for, uh, how to approach these complex problems. Uh, so if you, if this would be in a, additional skill set to have in your toolbox uh, if you're an experienced engineer. And for prospective graduate students, I mean, if, you, if you're planning to apply to European and uh, US universities, then uh, taking a course like this would make your life much easier when you go to the grad school. Uh, you'd have a upper hand because you would you'd have already seen a lot of material that you would see in your coursework uh, by taking this course. Um, also, uh, being able to use Fluent is a fairly valuable skill when you look for internships and jobs. So completing this course would make you more attractive to potential employers uh, when you're in market for internships and uh, jobs. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation.